Uh, like Alex said, I'm Nick Cornier from uh, Brisbane Hughes. I uh, will warn you guys, uh, this talk's a little more technical than the, the regular other media talks. Um, so if you're watching this from home, now is the perfect time to be here. So who are we? Well, uh, like I said, the Rhythm and Hughes. Uh, we've been in the news a lot lately. Uh, the thing that I'm most excited about the news about is uh, for the Academy Award we just got for uh, Mike High. Uh, so why we're doing this talk is uh, first give you motivation of why we would go and write uh, such a big piece of software. Go over the architecture of that software, and then sort of show you how we're utilizing the GPU in that piece of software. So to start, uh, what we really want to do is sort of modernize uh, some of our workflows uh, at Rhythm and Hughes. Uh, we're a 25-year-old company. We have lots of different uh, proprietary pieces of software. And um, every piece of software sort of evolved organically on its own. They had very different user uh, experiences. We also have a very large pipeline that basically just puts data, uh, passing data between these different packages. So we wanted to just come up with one unified user experience and also have a very streamlined pipeline. So some requirements for the system is that we wanted to take advantage of multiple cores, both locally on the machine, my buddy's machine next to me, and our render farm, and all of our international locations all from uh, the one workstation. We take advantage of multiple GPUs, uh, and also the cloud. Uh, the thing we want to do is decouple the interface from our actual computation engine, so the interface is always uh, sleek and fast. And uh, we want seamless integration not only with other rhythm new software systems, our asset management system, but systems like Shotgun, Metro, and so on. And finally, we want a very powerful system. And there we want to, uh, other programmers to be able to extend our system with C++, uh, our pipeline department to extend things with Python. Uh, if you're a technical artist, you should use Python. If you're a non-technical artist, uh, we want visual programming tools inside the system so they can create novel tools that allow them to get their work done faster. And finally, whatever uh, these guys come up with, we need uh, some sort of way to easily share their work. So we start off trying to create uh, sort of a lighting package, a positive package, but with these requirements, we figured out what we're really doing is that we're creating a platform in which we can create all of our computer software. We call that platform Chrome. So some of the things that we're doing right now, uh, we're using Chrome for our uh, book development, our scene lighting, uh, our compositing workflows, and a bunch of miscellaneous tools. And some of those tools are quite surprising. Uh, for instance, we do uh, our information management So the general design at its core is a dependency graph. Uh, the data uh, inside the dependency graph, the nodes represent uh, functions or work that needs to be done. The lines represent uh, data that is passed back and forth. This data is strongly tied to the key point. Uh, the dependency graph itself is completely stateless. There'll be more on that in a bit. And this is someone like a, a lot of other node-based systems. Uh, anything can be hooked up to anything. In a lot of systems, there's like in parameters where you can only type something in. Then you have hookup points where you can only hook things up. In Chrome, you can type in anything anywhere or you can type in anything else. Like I said, our nodes are stateless. Uh, because it's stateless, uh, it's basically a functional programming language at that point. So it's a lot easier to have multiple threads to traverse the uh, dependency graph in parallel. Now, you want things like global state, but a global state is evil in terms of parallel programming. So instead of global state, we have these things called uh, contexts. They live uh, within each thread. And you can these contexts as uh, request objects. Uh, these request objects say, OK, I want to compute tile 3, uh, layer 15, at frame 36. Uh, the important point is, is that uh, a lot of visual effects software out there, uh, concepts such as the current frame, is a global concept. Uh, in Chrome, it, it's all built into this context object thread. So that allows us is to sort of scale massively uh, with the number of threads in the machine. We can compute frames, tiles, all in parallel. Uh, the lines in that graph we saw before represents data. Uh, the data is passed down to something we call the property graph. And the property graph is uh, a graph, it's a data structure that just stores data. Uh, to make sense of that data, you basically 
you put an interface on top of it. And a property graph can be wrapped uh, with multiple different types of uh, interfaces. Uh, at a low level, we do obvious things like copy on write to uh, keep our memory footprint low. We also have a, a persistent cache uh, and heuristics to automatically cache any data that you generate. Uh, the idea being, if I generate this data today, why should I generate it tomorrow? Uh, the property graph is dynamically accessible by users at runtime, and again, it's all strongly typed. So that's a high, high level of, uh, overview of um, our uh, system. What I'm going to go now is sort of uh, what uh, one of the things that we've created with Chrome is our compositing workflow. If you don't know what a compositor is, a compositor is a piece of software. Uh, that assembles lots of different images together and usually outputs a single image. Uh, we're a nodal based compositor. The other huge nodal based compositor out there is uh, Nuke. It, Nuke's fairly interesting. Uh, it was written by a visual effects company, BD, and now it's available through uh, the Foundry. So, our uh, compositor is a GPU CPU hybrid compositor. Uh, what that means is that uh, we can run most of our nodes either on the GPU or the CPU uh, transparently. If we go back to the model of Chrome, uh, we had that node graph. When we traverse that node graph, we produce a property graph that has two main things in it. We have an instruction tree, which represents low-level operations that need to be performed. And then we have data callbacks. And these are objects that will feed the instruction tree data by calling back So here's an example of a node graph. It's a pretty simple node graph. Um, we're going to read in an image here, read in an image here, we're going to do A over B here, and then multiply the result of this by some RGB constant, and finally write it out to this. If we traverse this node graph in Chrome, what we'll come up with is an instruction tree. And again, an instruction tree is a low level representation of the work that needs to be done. So we have add operations, multiply operations in here, and even the level things like swizzles. The other thing we created in that traversal are callbacks. So callbacks are going to feed data to the instruction tree. See that the read image callback will feed the read image here in the instruction tree. And they do that by calling back into the dependency graph. So the instruction tree is a generic representation of the work that needs to be done. And we can take that generic representation and we can make it concrete. Uh, in our case, we can output it to either uh, a GPU representation, in this case GLSL, or to a CPU representation. Uh, we use a multi-core OpenCL notation for that. Uh, this is pretty important for the visual effects in the industry. Uh, at every artist's workstation, we have a GPU. The GPU notation seems to be faster, so we want to use that. We also have this thing and that's thousands of machines. Those machines generally don't have GPUs. So in, in order to take advantage of all that compute power, we have to be able to convert uh, that dependency graph into something that can run on the CPU. So an example of converting the dependency graph here into GLSL over here. You can see that uh, Usually uh, a node here comes out to a couple lines of code in that GLSL. Unless the node's complex, obviously it's worse. So what I've shown you is that we can go from the dependency graph to this instruction tree uh, to GLSL or OpenCL. One interesting uh, thing you can do with this approach is that other things can add on to the instruction tree. If you use visual effects software, it's quite popular that instead of hooking something up to a node, you can write simple mathematical expressions. These simple mathematical expressions uh, tend to be easier to read uh, and can be quite complex to represent it as a node graph. So for instance, here I wrote uh, an expression where I sample some image uh, with some sort of wavy uh, function here. The cool thing what Chrome allows you to do is that I can take this chunk of code, which is our, in our expression language, convert that to the instruction tree, and then graph that into the instruction tree with the dependency graph. And what I end up with is that I have an expression language that's just as fast as a node graph. And that's uh, something that you don't see too often in modern day compositors. 
usually you have a very fast dependency graph uh, evaluation, but the expression language is going to be the second thought and it's much, much slower. The other thing to note about Chrome is that uh, it was written by the some programmers. Uh, we have around 50 nodes in our repository. If you look at something like Newt, it has hundreds of nodes. The nodes that we define in Chrome are very low level as translates uh, higher level concepts like uh, place of text uh, and on the screen. The way we get away with this is that we have this concept called macros. And what macros allow you to do is to assemble low level nodes and package them into one node uh, that does something quite complex. So let's look at an example of that. Here we have a map example of macro node, it's a gamma node. Uh, gamma node is a pretty basic operation it's just a power function. It has one input, one output, and if we were to look at the control panel, uh, or the parameter panel, whatever you want to call it, uh, it would have a nice interface uh, that would like to set the exponent of the power function. So if I dive into this node, I guess the artist who created this uh, did a fairly you know, complex network uh, to actually define the gamma operation. He was able to define comments, uh, well define inputs and outputs, and through the system he was also define a nice interface for that control panel. So this is a huge benefit. Basically, we're taking artists and turning them into programmers. They're defining these macro nodes, and they're defining nodes that they absolutely want. So the cool thing about macro nodes is that because it goes through this uh, dependency graph traversal, it goes into this instruction tree, it's optimized along with that instruction tree. So if I write a C++ node that does a gamma, uh, those guys can write a node through macros, uh, the same node through macros, just as fast I as a C++ program before to write it. Uh, and that's great. Uh, macro nodes tend to include other macro nodes, and in production scripts we see uh, over a quarter million nodes uh, inside a, a production uh, file. So I want to talk a bit about uh, uh, some of the GPU problems that we've uh, run into. When you compute a value, let's say A, inside a Set, about, uh, set the value to A. Chrome will go off and start computing the image. And as it traverses the node graph, it's going to generate uh, hundreds of GPU API calls. Let's call it OpenGL. If I go to value B, so I move the slider a little bit, hundreds of other instructions are created. The problem is, is that the interface is decoupled from the actual computer. So it's really easy for the user to go in and just scrub the controls. And what that does is it generates tens of thousands of GPU commands. And quick, the driver quickly becomes overwhelmed. Uh, because the driver is overwhelmed, our interface starts to lock up because it also depends on the GPU. We have a similar problem with the CPU. The, uh, the interface needs the CPU, and our compute engine also needs the CPU. But the way we do this on the CPU is that when we compute a value A, it goes off and starts to and we uh, user moves the slider to B, as soon as B starts to compute, we cancel the operation for A. So we tell the system, hey, we're going to compute B now, stop computing A. The problem is with GPU APIs, you can't do that. Once you uh, submit a command, that command's going to run. You can't tell OpenGL, hey, I told you in this triangle, please stop that. So the way we get around this is that we basically implemented our own command keyword dispatch. Here, Every thread will collect commands as you traverse the dependency graph. At an appropriate time, logical batches will take the commands from that local thread and throw them into a global <coughs> dispatch queue. Now in that dispatch queue, there's a single context thread pair that communicates with the GPU. What the dispatch queue is going to do is that it's going to ensure that we feed commands to the GPU in the same manner that the GPU never gets backed up. The other cool thing we can do with that is that since we have a very good idea of all the commands that need to be sent to the GPU, we can now send cancellation commands to the commands we haven't sent to the GPU. So this effectively allows us to cancel commands that, to me, I think are already on the GPU. We can also support concepts like OpenCL native kernels that in OpenGL, it's very useful. Uh, now the system the GPU, GPU throughput is not optimal, 
but our overall uh, performance of the system is much more fluid. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, it's tricky to handle errors in this case. Um, as I submit commands to our dispatch queue, this, those commands are going to call GPU API commands. Those commands may fail. Uh, that means the error is going to be flagged asynchronously. And there's a bit of a challenge to take that asynchronous error, get it back to the thread that generated that command, and ultimately get it back to the user. It's tricky, but it's completely possible. Uh, another problem that uh, we've encountered is if you have a command A that is going to generate a resource that command B depends upon, what happens when the user cancels command A? Well, command B is already in the flight and it assumes that A is going to be done. Uh, this isn't a problem with regular uh, uh, OpenGL uh, GPU APIs because once you submit a command, it's absolutely going to be done. It's tricky to, uh, to solve, but again, it's completely possible. I also mentioned the single context thread pair. Uh, this is really easy to do that with the dispatch queue. The reason you want to do this is that even though if you read things like the GLX spec, and they said you should be able to have multiple threads and multiple contexts, OpenGL is going to be able to handle that. In practice, this doesn't work. Uh, you get crazy, crazy bugs in the driver. You just bang your head on the desk. Uh, the optimized path in the driver clearly seems to be the single context and the single thread of a pair to communicate with OpenGL. Uh, you also come in with a lot of uh, limitations on the GPU uh, in our system. Uh, this is limitations that everybody faces uh, in GPU programming. Uh, you don't have enough memory. Uh, you have various resources that are limited in different ways, like things like uniforms, variance, number of inches you, uh, images you can address. And we also run into instruction limits in our system. Because we have a quarter million nodes, we're trying to run everything all at once. Uh, you can quickly get instruction limits. The thing is, as users create these giant networks, they don't want to deal with this. So we as programmers have to do this automatically. Turns out this is not too bad for a problem to solve. If you look at that instruction tree we came up with before, we can analyze that graph and figure out how much memory we're going to use, how big our tile size should be, uh, how many uniforms and images we're going to use, and get a pretty rough estimate of the number of instructions that will be executed. Once we have that estimate, we take the instruction tree and we break it up into subtrees. We render out those subtrees and we composite all that together. Now the neat thing about this is that we can cache the output of those subtrees. What that means is that when I'm computing value A, uh, I can do intermediate caching of the instruction tree. When I go to compute value B, well, by changing the value to B, I only dirty certain subgraphs in that large instruction tree. So the computation for B should be a lot quicker because I can hit the cache for a lot of stuff I computed to A. Oh, okay, so I finished two minutes early. Awesome. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. For the GPU implementation, uh, we had uh, an implementation already for our uh, animation package that sort of assembled these shaders on the fly. So we use that and it's just sort of stuck around. Uh, at this point, we do have uh, OpenCL implementation for the CPU, and we can use that uh, also. We just turn the, the driver to use the GPU implementation instead of the CPU implementation. That's not so. Um, it's Could you not as question? optimized. Could you repeat the question, oh. please? Sorry, the question is, uh, does the OpenCL on the CPU give you good performance? It, it does not have as good performance as the GPU implementation by far. We haven't spent a lot of time on optimizing that. We haven't really spent We really want to get that uh, user experience uh, for the GPU fast. The only time we really run the CL stuff currently is on the queue and users don't really seem to care how long it runs. I mean, it takes a couple implemented in this approach. Uh, the lion's share of our compositor is using this approach. I read that we had a legacy uh, compositor, and we have nodes that can tie into that system. We also have auxiliary libraries uh, that we can tie into. Uh, but most of it, uh, for our current use, is using this system. But there's a large part of our compositor that allows us to access legacy code. 
And in which case, you know, we're obviously going to see people download the GPU, put it in the CPU, and upload it back. And Prom takes that. The nice thing about Prom is that since all those links are uh, strongly typed, we have a, a casting system that just automatically does that for you. So that's a program.